Welcome to a new episode of Cheaters Always Cheat. Like, subscribe, and share to stay connected. My wife cheated on me with a guy named Chad from her office. I found out when she left her Facebook Messenger logged in on the laptop, and I saw a message from Chad. Instead of reacting right away, I decided to keep my cool and think things through. I didn't want to end up regretting my actions later, like my brother did in a similar situation. He wished he had been more strategic and done something big to expose everything. I didn't want to feel that way, so I thought of a way to get back at both my wife and Chad. I wanted revenge that would really hit them hard. After a few days of planning, I realized the best way to do it would be to invite Chad's wife Sarah on a surprise double date. So, I messaged Sarah on Facebook and asked if we could talk over the phone. I thought she should know about her husband's infidelity and maybe together we could put an end to their affair. To my surprise, she agreed to meet with us. Sarah was surprisingly calm and collected about the whole thing. Instead of freaking out, she wanted revenge too. And she came up with a sneaky plan to make sure both of our cheating partners would get a taste of their own medicine. Sarah suggested we go on a date when we knew Jane and Chad would be sneaking around. We wanted them to catch us cheating on them, which would totally mess with their heads and be some epic revenge. At first I hesitated, but the more I thought about it, the more I loved the idea. We chatted a lot for a few days, looking for signs of when they'd meet up. Finally, we found out they'd be at the swanky bar on Friday night. Friday came, and Jane said she'd go out to eat with a friend and go shopping. I played along, my heart pounding, knowing my plan. Chad told Sarah he and the guys would go axe throwing, but we knew their real plan, so Sarah and I decided to go on our date and accidentally bump into them there to see their shocked faces. We even agreed to dress up and look amazing. By the way, Sarah did look amazing, no doubt about it. When my wife left, I acted completely normal. Once she was officially driving away, I sprang into action, getting ready for mine and Sarah's big night out. I picked up Sarah, and we drove, chatting excitedly about how things would unfold. Both of us were pumped yet nervous. My emotions were a mix of sadness and frustration, but the rush of adrenaline kept us focused on our revenge plan. When we got to the bar, we spotted Jane and Chad cozying up in a corner, laughing and flirting. My heart pounded as we sat at a table just far enough not to be too obvious, but close enough for them to see us. We held hands, pretending everything was normal, and ordered drinks and an appetizer, sneaking glances at them until they finally noticed us. The look on their faces was priceless, pure shock, like they'd seen a ghost. I could almost see the gears turning in their heads, trying to figure out what was going on. Sarah blurted out, They see us, you should kiss me. At first I couldn't fathom doing that, but then I gave in, and we shared a passionate kiss, fueled by our shared anger. I peeked through my hands and saw them in a complete tizzy, emotions all over the place. They must have been feeling so angry, exposed, and utterly confused. It was like the list of emotions could go on forever. After about 15 minutes of us laughing and flirting, Chad finally gathered the courage to confront us. He stumbled over his words, trying to pass it off as a coincidence that we were all there together, demanding to know what was happening. I acted all nonchalant, greeting him like an old buddy. Hey Chad, I said, as if we were just hanging out. What a surprise to see you here. Sarah and I just felt like grabbing a drink for fun. You remember Sarah, right? She's your wife. Chad's face turned beet red, and he started stuttering even more. Jane, watching the whole thing from their table, looked horrified, on the verge of tears. Before he could say anything else, Sarah jumped in. Oh, come on, Chad, we're not doing anything wrong. We're just two people enjoying ourselves, just like you and Jane. The look on their faces was absolutely priceless. They were caught red-handed, and they knew it. Chad was at a loss for words, mumbled some excuse about needing the restroom, and disappeared in a hurry. As for Jane, she couldn't handle it anymore. She stood up, tears streaming down her face, and stormed out of the bar. It was clear that she never expected to be on the receiving end of her own game. With our sneaky plan successful, Sarah and I gave each other a high five and a knowing look, feeling incredibly satisfied for turning the tables on our cheating partners. We hung out at the bar a bit longer, finishing our drinks and getting to know each other better. Despite the crazy situation that brought us together, 
We found out we had a lot in common, and genuinely enjoyed each other's company. As the night went on, we shared stories about our marriages, how we tried to make things work, and how we were both let down by our spouses. It was therapeutic to open up to someone who truly understood my pain. Eventually, it was time to call it a night. I dropped Sarah off at her place, and we promised to stay in touch. We knew tough conversations and decisions were coming our way, but at least we had each other for support. Over the next few weeks, both of our marriages fell apart. Jane and Chad were full of remorse, but it was too little, too late. Sarah and I leaned on each other as we went through the process of filing for divorce and dealing with all the emotional fallout. In the end, our little revenge scheme did more than just teach our cheating partners a lesson. It brought two hurting souls together and gave us the strength to move on from our pasts. Okay, so let me tell you this crazy and surreal story that happened during my honeymoon. My wife Emma and I just got married, and we were at this beautiful beach resort for our honeymoon. The first day was fantastic. We were enjoying each other's company, the sun, the sand, all the good stuff. But things got weird on the second day. Emma suddenly said she had to go back to our room to use the bathroom and get more drinks. Little did I know, she was actually sneaking off to meet someone else. Yeah, she cheated on me during our honeymoon. Can you believe that? I was in shock, my heart was racing, and I had no idea what to do. So, I made a decision, I ghosted her. I just disappeared, taking all our stuff with me. I couldn't stand being around her after what she did. It was tough, and I don't know if I'll ever fully recover from that experience. But at least I know I made the right choice for myself. I can't believe I had to go through all of that, but hey, life throws some crazy stuff at you. And that's my story of dealing with a cheating spouse during what was supposed to be a dreamy honeymoon. Alright, here's what went down. It all started when my wife Emma vanished for nearly an hour. At first, I didn't think much of it, but when it happened again on the third day, I started to feel suspicious. So, on the fourth day, when she said she needed to go back to the room, I decided to trail her. I told her I'd chill at the beach, but as soon as she was out of sight, I secretly followed her from a safe distance. When she reached the resort pool, I noticed this guy sitting there, waving to her. He wasted no time getting up to join her. They exchanged smiles and waves before walking together. I kept following them until they both hopped into the elevator. Now the stairs were right next to the elevator, and the resort only had three floors. So I dashed up to the second floor and peeked out the door. And there it was. I saw Emma heading into a different room with this other guy. I had seen him hanging around the beach, this muscular dude with a suntan, checking her out. But I never thought she'd be into him. My heart sank. I mean seriously I'm a good looking guy too, with a nice build and plenty of money. It was tough to believe what I was witnessing. The door closed behind them, and I just stood there in utter disbelief. What the heck did that guy have that I didn't? I was crushed, but I knew I had to act fast. I didn't want a big public scene. So, fueled by anger. I went back to her room, packed up our stuff, and decided to ghost her completely. I took both room keys and left her with only her swimsuit, the one she wore when she went into his room, and her ID, which I left at the front desk. Yeah, I know it was a jerk move, but I wanted to make it tough for her to get back home. Plus, I needed a head start to grab my things before she figured out what happened and caught up with me. As I walked to the parking lot, my hands were shaking, and I was a mess of emotions. But I was firm in my decision. I got into our car and started the 5.5 hour drive back home, leaving her to face the consequences of her actions. A few days later, after I moved out of our place, Emma's mom called and I picked up. She went on to scold me for everything I did and to tell me how tough her daughter had it trying to get back home. Okay, here's how it all went down. Emma totally panicked when she realized I was gone. She tried desperately to get back into our room but found herself locked out. She had no clothes, no cash, and no way to reach me. Yep, I even took her cell phone after she failed to get through to me from the hotel lobby phone and begged the staff to let her in. Eventually, they caved, but she found the room empty. I had taken everything. With no other option, she had to call her parents and spill the beans. They must have been livid, but they wired her some money so she could buy clothes and rent a car to go back home. I can only imagine how embarrassed she must have felt making that call. But you know what? I couldn't care less. In fact, I still don't care. It took hours for this whole mess to unfold. 
I only wish I could have seen the look on her face when she realized the consequences of her actions. And let me tell you, Emma's revelation didn't end there. So, get this. Turns out the rental car she got had a messed up gas gauge. It showed more fuel than it actually had. So she ended up running out of gas in the middle of nowhere, stuck on the side of the road, still in shock from everything that went down. She had to call for roadside help and wait for an hour until they filled her tank. It must have been a real eye-opener for her. And part of me can't help but think she got what was coming to her. I mean, one moment she's on her honeymoon, having a blast on the beach, and the next she's stranded, hungry, and left behind. Yeah, she deserved that. Anyway, I beat her to the apartment by a long shot. My buddy joined me to help, and I had all the time to pack my stuff and get out. I did it faster than ever. I didn't even bother leaving a note. I didn't want to give her the satisfaction of a face-to-face -face confrontation. She didn't deserve it. By the time she got back, I was long gone. My phone was blowing up with calls and texts from her, but I didn't bother responding. Her betrayal cut deep, and I couldn't bear to hear her voice or see her name on my screen. So, I took some drastic steps. First, I changed my phone number and deleted her contact from my phone. Then, I unfriended and blocked her on Messenger. I made sure there was no way for her to reach me directly. In the days that followed, I got messages from her friends and family on Facebook. Some scolded me for what I did, while others offered their support and sympathy. But I didn't bother responding to any of them. It was a roller coaster of emotions, but deep down, I knew I did the right thing. My trust in Emma was completely shattered, and there was no going back from that. After a few weeks, I finally got a long letter from Emma, sent to my parents' house. She filled it with apologies and explanations for her actions. She tried to justify herself, saying it was a momentary lapse in judgment, and that she still loved me. I could feel her pain in those words, but it didn't change the fact that she betrayed me in the worst way possible. I didn't bother responding to the letter, and I haven't spoken to her since. When I was about seven years old, my dad cheated on my mom with my stepmom Karen. After my mom's divorce, she moved away and remarried. I thought my mom had abandoned me, and my dad reinforced that belief. At that time, Karen had a five-year-old daughter named Mia. As we grew up, Mia and I were somewhat close, but as we hit puberty, our personalities became different. Mia was more of a typical girly girl, and she became quite attractive. People paid more attention to her, including my relatives, who seemed to prefer her over me. I, on the other hand, was more of a nerd who enjoyed sports, though some people still thought I was attractive in my own way. Despite that, I always felt overshadowed by Mia. My dad was always looking for opportunities to shine, even if it meant neglecting his own daughter. He noticed that Mia received more attention, so he focused everything on her. I felt a bit jealous, but I wasn't too bothered because I believed I'd be appreciated if I did well. I worked hard and got into a prestigious university, which led my father to throw a party for me since I was the first in the family to achieve this. However, Mia was jealous of my accomplishment. Anyways, during my last year of high school, I started dating Tim, 30M. He proposed during our sophomore year in college, but we decided to wait until graduation. Then, during a semester break, I went to his house and found him having closeness with Mia. I was extremely shocked, to say the least. I remember I was crying and yelling at him. The smirk on Mia's face is something I'll never forget. That's when I realized Mia was not a nice person. My dad and stepmom knew about the situation, and you won't believe what my dad told me. He said, you should forgive them. Tim stopped loving you and fell in love with your sister. Don't be petty, give them your blessing. I shouted back, of course you'd say that, you cheated on mom. It turned into a huge argument between my dad and me. He threatened to disown me if I didn't accept them and attend their wedding. I stormed off and for days I couldn't stop crying. That's when I realized I was on my own. My dad didn't seem to care whether I was alive or not. Thankfully I had friends I could rely on. One of my friends encouraged me to start therapy, and I'm grateful for that. Therapy helped a little, but I still wanted revenge in my mind. I felt like being petty and making her regret what she did. I thought about different ways to get back at her. Initially, I planned to wear white on her wedding day. However, I ran into Mia's ex-boyfriend, Jay. They had an on-again, off-again relationship, and Mia treated him badly. 
Their last breakup happened when Jay caught Mia flirting with one of his friends, but there was a lot of history between them. When Jay found out about Mia and Tim, he was pretty upset and wanted to get back at her for all the time she hurt him. So, I came up with a new plan. I asked Jay to be my date at her wedding. I knew Mia still had feelings for him, and I thought it would make her angry. We agreed that after the wedding, we would go our separate ways. On the wedding day, I wasn't in the wedding party, so my dad was okay with me being there, as I wasn't causing any trouble. I went to the wedding with Jay, and I wore a bright red dress because I heard it symbolized that you slept with the groom. It was a bit extravagant, and I'm sure I caught some attention. When Mia saw me with Jay, her face turned pale. I deliberately acted very close with Jay, whispering in his ear, touching his shoulder, and dancing intimately. I could see that Mia was just as red as my dress. During the wedding, I was also asked to give a speech. I kept it short, joking about Tim's supposed fetish for sleeping with his fiancée's sisters behind her back, implying he'd do the same with Mia if he had more sisters. Me and Jay were asked to leave after causing a scene. The next day, I received numerous messages and calls, but I didn't respond to any of them. As for Jay, he kept to our agreement, and I never saw him again. After the wedding incident, I decided to search for my mom because something inside me told me she hadn't abandoned me. It wasn't difficult to find her on Facebook, and we started chatting. She's now married and has two boys, my half-brothers. I learned the truth from her. She didn't abandon me. My father won the custody case and used her past substance obsession against her to take away her visitation rights. We reconciled, and for the first time in my life, I felt truly welcomed. I also got to know my stepfather and my two brothers and they're wonderful people. Since then, I've been regularly meeting them. Two years after the wedding incident, I met a guy named Andy. We connected during an alumni program at our college. He was a few years older than me, but we had a lot in common. Andy was kind, sweet, and very mature. He knew about my past and has been incredibly supportive. In every way, he was better than Tim. He had charm and held a high position in his job. After two years, my sister reached out to me out of nowhere and told me she was pregnant. She said she wanted to bury the hatchet and make amends. I was hesitant, fearing she might try to take Andy away from me as well. But Andy reassured me that he's strong and wouldn't let that happen. Despite my reservations, I wanted to reconnect with my dad, so I gave it a chance. I went out to dinner with Andy, and to my surprise, Tim recognized him. I later found out that Andy was Tim's boss, something I had no idea about. My dad and stepmom took me aside and said my relationship with Andy was unacceptable because I was trying to hurt my sister by dating Tim's boss. I didn't take their criticism lightly and told them to go away in strong terms. My love life is private, and they shouldn't interfere. The dinner didn't go well. Later, I received a drunken call from Tim, expressing his unhappiness with my sister and his desire to escape from the situation. He realized what he lost when he saw me with Andy, but I ignored him completely. Still, the phone calls didn't stop. First, my dad called to say that my relationship with Andy was causing problems between my sister and Tim. I replied that their marriage is not my concern. Then, my stepsister called, asking if she could come to my house and talk. I told her I wanted nothing to do with any of them after the dinner party. However, she didn't listen and went to Andy's office to convince him to talk to me. Tim saw this and accused her of trying to seduce Andy, just like he had done with him. To resolve the situation, Andy had to fire Tim for his misconduct, which added more tension. Tim became verbally offensive towards Mia and blamed her for ruining his life. Eventually, they decided to separate and Tim is now dealing with the divorce proceedings. After all the drama with Tim and Mia, my dad unexpectedly showed up at my apartment, crying because he caught Karen cheating with his male cousin. He was heartbroken. So, I reminded him of what he told me when Tim cheated on me, saying, Karen fell out of love with you, so she fell in love with your cousin. You should give them your blessing instead of being petty. My dad was confused, and I pointed out that he taught me to forgive when I was sad about Tim and Mia. His expression turned sour. Now, I have two family members going through divorce. Tim and Mia tried to reconcile, but ended up getting divorced. My dad apologized for what he did to me and my mom. I told him he got what he deserved, and I have no feelings left for him, not even pity. If the time ever comes, I might forgive him, but I don't want him in my life anymore.
he won't be walking me down the aisle. On a brighter note, Andy and I recently got engaged, and we plan to have a small ceremony with close friends and family. I initially wanted petty revenge, but karma seemed to have handled it better. I guess it's what they deserve for being terrible people. It may sound like fiction, but it's real life. Sometimes reality is stranger than fiction. I might update if anything significant happens, but for now I'm busy with wedding preparations. Update. I just want to clarify a few things. I referred to Mia as Cassie, because she resembles an actress with that name, and also because she loves being the center of attention. However, I wasn't an ugly duckling either. I just didn't want to draw too much attention to myself. My dad was very image conscious, which is why he favored Mia over me since she was attention grabbing. The only times he seemed to favor me were when I got into a prestigious university. Otherwise, I felt pretty invisible to him, as I reminded him of his failed marriage. Regarding the red dress, my original plan was to wear white. However, I read in a magazine that wearing vibrant red to a wedding implied you had slept with the groom. But honestly I don't think people really got the message. I should have stuck to white instead, haha. Uh -huh. I had no idea that Tim was working under Andy. When I found out that Andy was Tim's boss, Tim had only been at the company for three months. I had been to Andy's office a few times during lunch, but I never bumped into Tim. So I hope I've clarified things. Sorry, it's not much of an update. I've been busy with wedding preparations. Also, because my mother asked me to, I've decided to contact my dad. I'm willing to invite him to my wedding, even on short notice, and I'll cover his flight and stay. However, I'm setting some boundaries. I don't want Taryn and Mia at my wedding. My dad can walk me down the aisle along with my stepdad, who is a wonderful person. I know some of you may say my dad doesn't deserve it, but he's still my dad, and he's trying his best to reconnect with me. I can be amicable with him, and it would be really cruel to take away this opportunity from him. Update. I got married y'all, I'm really happy, don't worry, my stepmother and stepsister weren't invited at all, the wedding went smoothly, my dad attended, and we hugged and shed some tears. I'm not sure if I can fully forgive him for what he did, but we'll work on it in therapy, which he said he'd pay for. My dad will soon be getting a divorce from my stepmom. He walked me down the aisle with my stepdad, and there were no scenes created, we even had a dance together, that's pretty much it. I don't know much about Tim and my stepsister. I just want to say thanks to everyone who supported me. Right now, I'm on my honeymoon, relaxing and hoping for a peaceful new chapter in my life. And to the commenter who mentioned twins, thanks. Although I hope it's not twins but triplets, RIP my vag, haha. <laughs> my husband and I have discussed having kids, but that's reserved for the future. Thanks for being there for us. Now it's time for me to enjoy the beach and have mimosas. Adios. I recently found out that my ex-wife, in her 40s, is dealing with a serious illness, though the official diagnosis is still pending. It seems to be either a severe autoimmune disorder or cancer. Honestly, I feel a sense of happiness about it, even though I hate that I feel this way. But I believe I have valid reasons for these emotions. During our more than decade-long marriage, she cheated on me continuously, with multiple men, and betrayed me in every possible way. I knew about her affairs right from the start, catching her first one about a year after we got married. She blamed me, using the excuse that I didn't support her enough after our child was born. I didn't leave because I knew fathers rarely get custody, and she projected this image of being a super mom. The best I could hope for was 50, 50 custody, and I didn't want to miss too much time with my daughter. We tried to work things out, and she promised it wouldn't happen again. However, a couple of years later, I caught her cheating again. We almost divorced, but she manipulated me with love bombing, and being naive, I still loved her, so we stayed together. By now, I had learned all of my ex's mannerisms, and can easily tell when she's lying to me. She also changes her personality to match whoever she's romantically involved with. She did it with me, her previous boyfriends, and even the guys she cheated on me with. Tracking her affairs became quite simple just based on that. However, she genuinely believed she had kept everything hidden from me. During our marriage, my ex made some messed up claims to gaslight me. She actively gaslit me and took advantage of me. At different times in our relationship, she accused me of various forms of offense, which she later admitted were untrue. For instance, a few years ago, she accused me of financial offense and trying to isolate her from friends. I reminded her that I had been encouraging her for years to get a job, 
both to have her own money and to make new friends. I actively supported her in going out and making friends, and she had access to all our money. She even accused me of the offense because I initiated closeness after our child had gone to bed, and when she declined, I stopped and went back to what I was doing. It was really just that, nothing else. The accusations were all meant to gaslight me, distract from her affairs, and keep me on the defensive. But knowing that, didn't make it any less painful. She later admitted that she knew none of it was true. Towards the end of our marriage, she ran out of excuses for not being close with me, and even cited me not breaking down boxes in the recycling as the reason. You can't make this stuff up. I endured over a decade of gaslighting and cheating. Honestly, I'd do it all again because I got to witness my daughter's happy early years, and she lacked nothing. Eventually, it was time to end the marriage. My daughter was old enough to understand divorce, and I was tired of being in a lifeless marriage with constant betrayal. I felt confident that in a legal battle, I would get primary custody, so we got divorced. It went relatively smoothly, given the circumstances. I had come to accept that my ex is a deeply flawed person, and I didn't think anything could hurt me more than I had already experienced, so the worst was behind me. I kept the house and became the primary residence for my daughter. After our divorce, my ex was supposed to move into a rental unit I owned so we could co-parent jointly and remain close for our daughter's sake. I wasn't keen on this arrangement, but it's what my ex fought for during the divorce negotiations. She emphasized doing what's best for our daughter and staying nearby until she graduates. However, within six months of the divorce, before she even moved into the rental, she made things official with one of her multiple partners and planned for him to move in with her. Suddenly, the rental plan didn't work for her. She directly told me it would be awkward to be close with him in your house. All her talk about being a good mom and doing what's best for our kid vanished because she wanted to be with him. She promised to find a place in town instead. We continued living together during this time because it's tough to find apartments in my area. After a couple of months, she tells me she actually found a place six, seven towns away, about a 45-minute drive, and has already signed the lease. She plans to spend a holiday with the new guy there but promises to come back to pack and spend weekends at her new apartment to ease the transition for our daughter. However, after the holiday, she never returned to stay. She only came back to pack her stuff. In the first month, the only time she saw our daughter was when she came to get her belongings. She also left her dog behind and hasn't visited the dog since she left. Currently, she takes our kid for just one night a week, only on a school night. When you factor in driving and sleep time, she spends a mere three, four hours with our daughter per week. All the super mom facade has completely disappeared. She promised to increase her time with our kid to three, four times a week after settling in for a month or two, but she hasn't made any effort to do so. In fact, when she informed me that she was sick, her message seemed to set up a future excuse to bail due to illness. The only thing she's doing is paying the minimum amount of child support required, so I guess there's that. The most heartbreaking part of this whole mess was discovering a couple of months after she moved away that she had been having a five-year affair with my best friend. I had noticed she was interested in him, and they spent time together alone, but I had complete trust in my friend. I believed he wouldn't do anything and would resist her advances. It was the ultimate betrayal of my life. This friend had been my confidant throughout the divorce, all the while they were having an affair behind my back. Both my ex and this friend collaborated to gaslight me and isolate me from my family and friends. At that time, they were the only two people I talked to regularly. I even considered moving closer to where my friend was going, being completely deceived and blind to everything happening around me. It turns out, I wasn't the only one betrayed in this situation. My former friend was married to my sister-in-law during the affair. The affair continued until my ex-wife made her relationship official with her current boyfriend. This means she was still involved with my former friend while her relationship with her boyfriend was unofficial. The story of revenge for my former best friend is still unfolding, but I'll share that tale another time in a different subreddit. Let's just say there will be no mercy for my former friend. However, I gave my ex a choice for the sake of our daughter. I offered her a chance to come clean, and she was smart enough to admit to some of what she did. If not for my daughter, I'd have taken severe action against her. But because of my daughter's love for her mother, 
I decided not to act. I won't be the one to shatter what's left of her childhood. Though she'll find out someday, it won't be from me. My ex can't escape that reality, and she will face the consequences of her betrayal in the future. I'd stop it if I could, just to spare my daughter from suffering, but I can't. It's inevitable, and my ex will deserve it. I've never truly hated anyone in my life until now. I don't like that I feel this hatred, even though it's justified considering what happened. Hate isn't in my nature. I've never taken pleasure in the suffering of another living being. Yet I can't help but feel happy about my ex-wife's unknown illness, which might lead to her suffering or a long recovery. Even the fact that she's anxious about waiting for results brings me some satisfaction. I don't want to feel happy about it. I know it makes me a bad person, and I lose the moral high ground, but I don't care. I can't help but feel happy that she's suffering. Maybe someday she will experience the same pain I endured during our marriage. I've never been a believer in karma, but this situation might make me start to believe in it. There's no one in my life who deserves bad things to happen more than my ex. I hate them both for making me feel this hatred. I hate that they've taken away a part of who I used to be and was proud of. So yeah, my ex-wife is seriously ill, and despite knowing it's wrong, I can't help but feel a sense of happiness about it. Don't forget to subscribe, like and click on the little bell icon for notifications of new stories.